Well, hi, everybody. This is Terry, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we have Peter Reznicek, one of the founders of ShadowTrader.net. Peter's been actively trading since 2003 and has been educating traders since 2006 through the Shadow Trader website. He is the voice of the Shadow Trader Weekly, the Sunday video update that comes out and has thousands of subscribers that view it each week. If you haven't watched it, I strongly suggest that you take a look at it. It is really a great perspective for the market as to what happened and what could possibly happen in the upcoming week. Peter's also the writer and producer of Peter's Pre-Market Perspective, focusing on understanding the overnight market activity prior to the opening, levels of interest for the upcoming session, the interpretation of market-generated information, and concrete ideas and scenarios as to what's potentially possible for the current session. Peter's pre-market perspective, which is widely read, is available every morning, and before that's before the bell, obviously. And if you're interested, go to shadowtrader.net and take advantage of the complimentary week subscription and experience it yourself. Peter's main focus is on short-term directional trading of options and futures using the synthesis of technical analysis, the market profile, and market internals. And at this point, I wanna turn the screen over to Peter. And Peter, welcome to the webinar. So you guys should see the um, got the internal stuff. So there's a okay. There's kind of sure. thing. okay. Terry, what did you want to do as far as format? Did you have any uh, specific questions you wanted to to start with, or how did you want um, to proceed? Well, I would like I'd like to address one question that I got. I talked to a couple of people this week, and one of the questions was on your market profile display and on the key that you have for using the market profile. You mm -hmm. talk about you use the volume point of control versus the TPO point of control. And the question I've got is, most teachers of the market profile use the TPO. Why do you use the volume instead of the TPO point of control? Yeah, this is, this is an excellent question. So I think the, the answer is twofold. Um, let's start with the one that, let's start with one that, people probably would not think of. And I hate to say it, but this, but it is important. Understand that I write a report that thousands of people read every morning. And people rely on this report for key levels. The TPO point of control is not as specific, right? It's very obvious if we look just at, let's just look at this profile here, for instance. So this one here is the TPO point of control, but there are other distributions where, for instance, there are many that are. For instance, here, there are five different price levels that would be considered the TPO point of control. However, here's the volume point of control, which is just as wide. So it would be an absolute Pandora's box of just mayhem of people asking me every day, well, why isn't it this? Why isn't it that? Why did you choose the TPO? So I made a choice early on that if I was gonna present this information, I had to choose a data point that was as specific as possible so that there cannot be any uh, confusion or question as to what is what, okay? So that's, that's a huge part of it. Second part of it is that I have a lot of experience in reading the profiles, trading against the profiles, et cetera. And I have found in my experience that, the vol that even though it may go against the grain of what is the traditional way of looking at the profile, and I do understand that time is really the, you know, the, the most important component of the profile because it is by itself what makes the profile different, correct? Regular charts also have price on them. They also have highs and lows. They also have volume on them. But the market profile chart is special because it has time. It doesn't just go up and down, it goes across. And it, and it tells us 
okay, this 30 minute period, this is where prices were, this 30 minute period, this is where prices were. And that's what makes it special. So I don't wanna in any way minimize that, but I have found that the volume point of control is extremely accurate. It is worthwhile to look at. And also that being said, however, and I always end any discussion on this question with this point, is that people who ask this question should definitely understand that I do not in any way, shape, or form ignore where the TPO point of control is. I'm very, very cognizant of any areas, not just the point of control, but any areas that are fatter versus thinner. Those are very often areas where more time was spent, where more value is perceived. Those are almost always areas where price will react or more importantly, be pulled to. The general theory that I think works very well, which is basically how prices work, is remember, prices are always just going to be um, looking for the area where there is greater value. So they reject areas of low value. So for instance, that's why if there's a gap fill, for instance, it'll just zoom through the gap because the gap is a void of price action. There's no value there. And it'll go to the next area of value. And the reason that, that price is doing this is very simple, is because that's the essence of what an efficient market does. And the best way to understand that, and I've, I've used this analogy all the time, many of you, you know, maybe who have heard me speak on these topics before, you may remember this, but don't think of it as futures contracts. Think of it as widgets. Think of it as automobiles. Think of it as whatever. If I own a store and I'm selling a product, I can't know, and let's say, let's just say it's a new product. A perfect example would be like a new product that doesn't have a history of sales or whatever. I mean, I have to find the price over time. The market will tell me what the fair price is. And at that fair price, what's going to happen? That's where I'm going to sell the most widgets or whatever they are. So the purpose of any market is distribution of the goods, services, futures contracts, whatever it is, right? The whole purpose of any market is to distribute because without a market that can distribute, you would just be alone at your factory or whatever, holding your stuff. Like what good is that, right? You can make all the things you want, but if you can't sell them, you've got nothing. So you need a market for that. And where, what is a market? A market is simply a mechanism that will define a price that is fair for those goods. And at that price that is fair, that's where most of the exchange of the goods should take place. People are comfortable with that price. They feel it's fair. They feel that what they're, they're getting value for, what they're paying for, they're, they're giving consideration in the form of money. They're getting this product. Both parties are happy. When both parties are happy, more sales happen, right? If, if it's outside of that range, then less sales will happen because price will click quickly adjust to the new to the new level, uh, et cetera. All right, let me just close this off. All right, very good. Very so good. yeah, Thanks. so that's that's basically it, Terry. You know, I mean, I don't want to belabor that point, but um, you know, those wide areas are where um, you know where price uh, where price is the fairest is is definitely something I'm paying attention to. But as far as the the pocket itself, uh, you know, I, I prefer to just use the volume one. Well, you know, it's interesting, Peter. That is a question that there isn't a day that goes by that we don't get that question. Um, Jim, as you know, prefers the TPO profile uh, point mm -hmm. of control, and you like the volume one. And the thing is, it's not about one or the other. It's about how you choose to look at them in configuring the profile to fit you. And that's you correct. highlighted using the volume one. And that's very much like the way I use it because I can certainly vis uh, see the TPO point of control just by looking at it in most cases. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> there's a question here. You want to just elaborate on this, Peter? Uh, sure, it, absolutely. 
it's a, okay. It's what does TPO mean? Well, TPO just stands for time, price, opportunity, and and that's simply the the title you know that was given to it. I guess a long time ago that might have been uh, Steidelmeier probably or, or Kevin yeah. Coy or you know some of these early uh, uh, people who who started putting the profile together, and you know that's just the the name that's given to each individual letter. So when you look at this, I'll just make today's big here. Each letter is considered a TPO, and it makes sense because. You know, at every price, there is obviously some opportunity. So they called it time, price, opportunity, right? Where, where, where time and price basically come together at the intersection of time and price, you put a letter and then price moves to a different area. And if you're still in the same time period, you mark the same letter. So you can see obviously in the profile, B, 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 B going up. And then uh, at 10 a.m., we go to C. At 10.30, we go to D, et cetera, et cetera. And we just keep kind of printing as we go. Right. Thanks, Peter. That question was right here, just popped up, so I thought I'd give it to you. No, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And and also, I just want to mention, Terry, is is um, if uh, some of the things that we that we may be mentioning in this discussion together, um, as far as uh, you know, uh, keywords about the profile, like we might say things like point of control, we might say things like TPO, poor high, or whatever. There's a glossary of these terms at our website, so if anybody's interested. Uh, they can go to shadowtrader.net and scroll down to the bottom at the footer of the website, like where the about us and, and disclaimers and all that stuff is. And there's a link to the glossary. If you click that glossary, it's all alphabetized. You'll see that you can mouse over and get a big tooltip of any of the terms that we talk about. And also uh, folks who subscribe to my pre-market perspective, which is my morning letter about the profile, uh, those words are automatically all tooltipped. So if I say a word, a keyword or whatever, uh, and you don't know what it is, and it's written in the in my commentary or in the scenarios or anywhere in the report every day. You just mouse over it, and a tooltip will pop up and define it for you. Yeah, well, I'd like to add to that, Peter. Though is also under the profile in the pre-market uh, perspective, you also have the profile key there, which is very helpful for explaining how you have color coded different things such as the halfback, et cetera. So, right, exactly, exactly. That's correct. So that's correct. be sure to, and that's very easy to print out. He has it right there on the website underneath the profile on the perspective every day. Yeah, that okay. is true. All right. Um, let's see, there was one question here I wanted to ask you, as long as we're doing questions for a start here. Oh, do you ever expand the profile? So, I don't generally. What what I think people are a lot of people have noticed Jim Dalton doing that, and I'm not against that in any way, shape, or form. However, having been a student of Jim's and understanding how Jim views the profile and how he trades, um, he is a. I think he's a more pure. And I'd like to. I'd, I'd get your opinion on this, Terry, too, because I know you go way back with Jim, but. I feel like he's a more purist in terms of a, a more pure profile trader because he has less uh, less emphasis on charts, less emphasis on you know market internals, things like that. So you know Tim or Jim Jim rather will typically look at things like well you know when G period comes out of F period you know that's a trade or you know the G G period failed to take out the high of F period and prior to that we know that the high was poor. So the market should come off a little anyway. So, you know, my signal is when that G period failed to take out F, things like that. In these types of situations, it's extremely helpful to have the profile separated out so, so that you can see each line or column rather of the 30 minute period separate as opposed to bunched together the way I have it. But I just think it's it's just a different style of trade. You know, it's it's not what I do, but. I, I would get your two cents on that too, Terry, because like I said, I know you've traded with Jim a lot. Yeah, um, it really comes down to personal preference again. And that is, is that some people can visualize the individual periods in a collapsed profile. Other people mm -hmm. have a difficult time visualizing it. Again, you can have both on the screen at the same time, or you can have one or the other. And so it's, again, user preference yeah absolutely absolutely okay 
Peter, I'm going to divert from the questions a minute, and I'd like just to give kind of a scenario of what you see in the current market, and then we'll come back to a few questions, and then we'll talk about the future market, okay? Absolutely. So the current market, and we'll talk about it like vis-a-vis -vis the, the profile because we have it up already, and, and um, I know a lot of your audience is, is interested in how, how in you know in looking at things through the lens of the profile so what i'm basically seeing right now is and this has been going on for a while and and there's no telling how long it can go on for but it's it's a very momentum driven market and jim often uses the phrase like what's the ruling reason and sometimes i've heard him say the ruling reason is get it higher you know they want to get it higher and I think that's really it. And in doing so, what happens is people sometimes get caught up in short-term signals in the profile, for instance, that don't come to fruition. And, and so, for instance, I want to just, let me just get a drawing tool up, if I can, Terry, so I can just sure. draw just what's happened over the last couple of days. This is like a classic thing that people kind of look at. Well, let me just give it a color and do that. Okay, so for instance, we had here an overnight low that came right to a settlement. So you can look at that two ways and say, well, that low is poor. And obviously overnight uh, lows and highs don't have as much import in terms of pattern as they would in the RTH. But I like to look at them. I, you know, I like to pay attention to things like that. I, I often mention that I look at 45 degree lines on overnight because I think they're, you know, secure until they're not, you know, things like that. So there, as I said, there's two ways to look at that. So you can say, okay, it's poor. But when I look at something like that, when I see that, I think to myself, you know what? Buyers are in control because that's how, that's how short-term buyers act. Like they're not waiting for any more meaningful pullback. Notice that this was a relatively large range. Here's half back of that range. Are they going to half back? No, they're not, they're not going halfway. As a matter of fact, they're, you know, they're, they're gapping the market all the way up here. They're, they're trading it overnight, pushing it up to here, they're opening it here. Here, you have a huge gap created. Did any of it fill? No, none of it filled. The day after the gap, it opens and just screams higher. Well, when it screams higher, what does it do? It leaves a lot of emotion. We'll just put an E here. We'll say emotion, single prints. So again, you see what I mean? That you have this stacking of, of poor structure. You have this stacking of, of things that should retrace but the market doesn't care about that same thing with today did we budge no where's value overlapping to higher poor high just basically a very squat profile just basically a lot of balance where's the high in the overnight session probably not secure the you know market will probably take that out at some point because we know that most auctions they just generally don't end that way you know that's kind of ending on a whimper and not a bang there's no rth excess here there's an overnight high, that's the high of the move, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very important to look at this stuff in the right way, that you do not want to get caught up in the traditional textbook interpretation of the profile and see these structures as weak and give them more value than they should. This market has proven to us over and over and over for, it's going on years now, literally, that that's not what the market is doing. And that in and of itself is something important for students of the profile to know and understand. The interpretation of the profile changes constantly. Initial balance used to be a thing. Nobody talks about it anymore. Ask Jim Dalton if he uses it, he'll say, no, doesn't matter anymore, right? 80% rule, not much of a thing as it used to be. Market has uh, momentum buyers constantly in control. What I've noted is the extremes of the value area are not as good trades as they used to be. A number of years back, you would fade the value area high, value area low all the time. Doesn't happen as much anymore. It's not important to know why. It's just important to know that these things are happening. That is the essence of, of 
of trading itself, of the markets, right? Is that things constantly move and shift and change. So in this instance, what, why I'm mentioning all this is because the traditional way of looking at all this is to look at all these data points stacking and say, aha, well, you know, a liquidation break must be coming. And that's all well and good because it could be coming. But just make sure that you are very, very closely monitoring for continuation when any of these key levels get taken. Because what we've seen in this market over and over, let's just take the last few months. We don't need to go back years. Let's just keep it in a time frame that everyone can remember. What's been happening over and over is that the profile is giving us clear signs of what the market should do and the market thumbs its nose at it every time. For instance, class, and I'm not predicting this, but I'm just saying here's a scenario of how this, how what I just said could play out tomorrow. You have unfilled gap. You have single prints. So both need repair, correct? You have very tight situation here that failed to take out the overnight high. You have a poor high here, so you know that there are short-term buyers trapped here. So your thought process is, let's say that we open up flat tomorrow somewhere here. Your thought process is, aha, this has to be a short. I am gonna short this low and it should go into the single prints or something, or, or at least to the top of the single prints, whatever. Maybe it's just a little target. Maybe you think, you know, we're overbought. It should go in, into the single prints. And what does the market do constantly? Takes out that low on very slow tempo, very grindy, middling internals. 11 sectors that dominate the S&P are all split 50-50. So people mistakenly look only at Infotech and they say, oh, look at this. You know, Amazon's down, Apple's down, here it comes. s and is gonna crack, but they don't realize that consumer staples, consumer discretionary healthcare are moving to the upside and the S&P does nothing. And it just goes a little bit below the thing uh, and, it, and it goes sideways up. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just what the market is. My point is I don't want people to just make that mistake. Don't just look at the profile in a vacuum. Don't look at this poor, these structures in a vacuum. Everything is one data point, and the market is not going to do anything that you want it to do until you have many ducks in a row. It takes effort, and not really effort's not the right word, but you know, in order for an army to advance, right? Think about it, to advance and to break through some enemy line. You need all the soldiers marching in the same direction with a few tanks behind you, with some planes overhead, whatever it takes, right? That's the analogy that just came to mind. If five or six guys, you know, run forward, you know, and think they're gonna do something, well, they're gonna get pushed back. And that's the exact thing that happens is that because the sentiment in the market is so bullish, I fear that people constantly get chewed up in trying to short this and it doesn't work because they're missing this, because they're putting too much weight on certain data points instead of just carrying them forward for later and they're not seeing the bigger picture and not understanding that against the backdrop of this type of tone, and that really is the most important thing in the markets. That I can't stress that enough. The most important thing in the markets more than anything is to understand and know the current tone. What is the ruling reason? What is the zeitgeist out there? What is the collective mindset of everybody doing? That's all that, that's 90% of the game, right? But this is not a market to be shorting. There's just nothing short here. If you're doing that, you're completely ignoring what the market is actually doing, and you're thinking about things that are non-market generated information. Perfect example, Jackson Hole, right? Jackson Hole is coming up uh, this uh, week, Thursday and Friday. It's not even in Jackson Hole this year, it's on Zoom. Because of COVID, it's, you know, they're not even going out there, which I agree, they shouldn't be. But 
you know, I'm sure there are people thinking something negative is going to happen. Well, it might, but I would ne but me personally, I wouldn't get in front of something like that and bet on it. Why? Because it's non-market generated information. It's completely opinion. It's just guessing. It's like, yeah, they might say something bearish. I don't know. Like, it, it, it just it just doesn't make sense. And that that's where I feel that this sort of analysis deeply of the profile and putting it all together with multiple data points is really where the profile shines, where people can can uh, you know uh, work to their uh, greatest potential. I think as traders. And their greatest potential, I think, will be uh, realized. I think when they take a, a wider view, and you know, and just kind of understand these core concepts that that um, you know, kind of knowing what it takes to move a market, basically. You know, Peter, what you're saying is so so important. Uh, we see this all the time, where people want to know what is the pattern. And as you recall, there used to be many different types of day session patterns or yeah. the ones for the short covering or the long liquidation. Yep. They, yep. Want to hang, they want to hang their hat on that pattern, uh, providing a definition of how they should react or respond. That is correct. What, what is they correct. miss is exactly what you're saying. The market profile is nothing more than a tool to help you see potential scenarios, different types of scenarios, by interpreting that information as a basis for making an informed decision. Yeah, that yeah. is it. Jim always says that 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 you should organize information better than the next guy or girl, right. whatever. Right? The organized information. That's what you should work towards doing. And. That's really what the profile software does. Think about it. What is what is market profile software? What's the purpose of of having this chart that we're showing right here? The chart organizes information for you. That's all, right? It it puts it all into a a very visual uh graphical representation that organizes price and time in this graphical manner so that in looking at it at a glance, we know aha 44, 84, 50 is the fairest price to do business. Done. I see it right away. Where did we close? Okay, right here at the red box settlement. Here's the high and the low. Uh, where's the kind of tail of the distribution? Well, it's obviously here and here. Not too many people traded there. Oh, let's look at this prior day. Oh, look at this. At a glance, boom. Nobody traded here. Hmm. That's a problem. What happens if price goes through there? Well, I would expect it's not going to support. That's my first inclination, but I'll monitor for continuation. But if we hit this level hot and heavy, Yep, probably a short because at a glance, I know, boom, that's probably not going to support. Whereas if I was looking at this information on a traditional candlestick chart, right? Let's just take this day it, as an example. It opened here and let's draw it as if it was an OHLC, right? OHLC looks like this. It has your little open thing. It has a high and then it puts a little line where the close is. That's what an OHLC chart looks like. This OHLC chart tells me absolutely nothing about the nature of what was going on in here. Whereas this chart tells me everything about what was happening in here. And that's a huge difference, huge. Excellent, Peter, excellent. But there's a kind of, a, there's a question here that I would kind of piggyback on that. It says, what do you think that, let me read here. Oh, why do you think the market continues to put in new highs with all the stuff in, in uh, quotation marks going on in the world? That's the, that's the disconnect that, that keeps the market moving higher because it likes that, that sort of wall of worry that keeps the market moving higher. And I, I understand this question, obviously, because it's the, it's the obvious question that everybody asks. It's on everybody's mind. It's it's sometimes on my mind too. But the best, I think, antidote to that type of thinking is just to remember that it's nothing more than a two-way auction. There are more buyers than sellers. Uh, one of the fundamental things you can look at is, you know, no matter what, as as bad as our own 
fiscal situation is being grossly mismanaged in Washington, we're still the cleanest dirty shirt. And we've been the cleanest dirty shirt forever. And the US dollar is still the world's reserve currency. And we still have uh, strong uh, property rights, which is actually a very important thing. That's actually something that international markets value is, is what, what type of property rights uh, are in that, that country. And that, that matters what their currency does and, and rates and, and what, you know, how they're valued. And we still have all that. Uh, you know, at the rate we're going, I don't know if we'll have all that forever, but that's the thing. So a big part of it to me is that I think it's the only game in town. You know, I mean, if you are somebody extremely wealthy from another country, well, you need some place to put it all. Well, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, right? I mean, think about it. When you have huge amounts of money that you need to park in places, and there's no return anywhere. This is another reason why, you know, why does it keep going up? What? Well, where's the return elsewhere? Especially, and especially, and I know this is a complete conundrum that, that is absolutely wreaking havoc with minds 50 times smarter than me and Terry and whomever. Why is the bond market going up at the same time as stocks? I have no idea. And every morning, on the way to my office, I listen to Bloomberg, and somebody mentions this almost every morning, and not a single expert has a, an answer to this question. And uh, no, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, bond prices go up, yields keep getting depressed lower and lower. And that in and of itself, even though nobody seems to understand why, uh, is also another reason, I think, of why equities continue to outperform, right? Because think about it. There's just no yield. Not only is there no yield in fixed income anywhere, it gets worse and worse every day, right? They just, just keeps going lower. We had a, a panic not too long ago uh, thinking that, uh, tech, that you know, tech was going to pull back big time because the yield on the 10-year went to 175. Well, now it's 50 basis points lower. And, you know, go figure. It just, it just collapsed. As much as there was fear of the of of uh, you know those rates going higher and hurting uh, growth company stocks, it just completely fell apart. So, you know that that's my take on it. My take on it is is like I said, the cleanest dirty shirt, only game in town, and then obviously the activities of the of the FOMC, which are, you know, over the top in terms of of, of stimulus and and you know, uh, kind of being the the person behind the curtain of all of this. So. I think that that if there has to be a reason, I think those are the reasons. Got it, Peter. That was good. Okay, here's a couple. Of, might as well stay on some questions here. Then we'll go to the future uh, outlook for the market. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do do your market profile charts increase your focus in selecting and executing trades? And if so, how? Do they do they increase focus? Yeah. Increase yeah, I think, so. I, I think so. I've, I've said that Terry, Terry and I have had multiple discussions before about this or about just about trading in general. And if you recall, I've I, on pretty much every interview that I've had with Terry, I've always said I am not a full time futures trader. And that's the truth. I, I'm not a person that uh, comes into the market every day with the idea, what am I going to do in the ES? It's just not my my, you know, weapon of choice, so to speak. I do. Uh, do uh, plenty of uh, day time frame trading, but uh, mostly in equities. So I feel like I have to say that, you know, first in, in order to answer the question properly, because I'm not a full time ES trader, but the market itself, a huge part of it is the ES because, right, because we're looking at a future that, uh, you know, is a proxy for the SP 500, right, for that cash market and also trades 24 hours and gives us indication of how what sentiment is overnight et cetera et cetera so you know to, so to that degree i would say it's not that granular for me because outside of a few patterns that i notice and and employ uh such as i talked about you know poor high poor low single prints et cetera points of control et cetera uh i'm not a you know hardcore futures trader that would be picking apart uh you know every part of the profile and and entering on certain uh, you know, 
my minutia or very uh, you know nuanced levels that I see. But that being said, the profile is one of many data points, and in the hierarchy of all those data points, I do hold it in very very high regard. Like there's technicals, which to me have to drive everything. Uh, and and there's market internals on a more uh, granular day level, and then there's and then there's profile. And profile is good because, as we discussed earlier, it gives you an extra added element of depth to what is going on in the candlestick charts of the technicals. You can see a daily chart that the S and P is doing this, blah blah blah, and the NDX is doing that, and this is what the Russell is doing, whatever. But again. As we just, as I showed earlier with this whole, with this little single print discussion here, right? The profile shows us a completely added dimension on top of what the candlesticks don't show us. And there, that is what makes it such a valuable uh, piece of information and data point uh, to use. Great. Okay, couple more questions, Peter. Yeah, sure, whatever you like, Terry. Got it, okay. How does the profile help you deal with noise and chop? Oh, that's an excellent question. So that's, this is, this is I'm actually very glad that was asked. This is a fantastic question. The way to, to, and I hope this should be helpful to many people, I hope, is the profile helps us in that way because it gives you those signals of what I refer to, this is kind of a, a, a term that I came up with called WWSHD, which stands for when what should happen doesn't. So for instance, in the example that we gave earlier where we know that this is a tight range and it's an inside bar, right? It's inside of this range. And so you would figure that being that given that the structure underneath it is poor, you could make the argument that, okay, the market, sh we know what the market should do when it gets to here. We know what the market should do if it went underneath here. If it came into this section, it should repair all the single prints and trade through and fill the gap. We know what the market should do. So the way the profile is such a fantastic tool for helping you to navigate CHOP is that when the market doesn't do what it should, meaning for instance, like classic example would be, you get some selling and you go into the top of the single prints and you go like, and the tempo is just really slow. And then it just goes like this and it comes out. Do you see how you're using the profile to tell you that it's choppy or more importantly to tell you that the move that's happening is not an initiative move. And think about how you could use this to your advantage. This is huge information that the market is giving you. Because for instance, you buy, and I'm not talking about futures, but let's just pick a Apple, whatever. You gap up, you're bullish, boom, you buy Apple. This day happens, you've got profits. This day happens, stock goes a little higher, today Apple's down nine cents, you don't sell. But now tomorrow, as I said, you think to yourself, you know what, what am I gonna do with this apple? Well, I'm gonna use this to my advantage. We go below here, maybe it's a sell, but I'd like to see what the tempo is like. Is it fast, is it slow? What do the internals tell me? Does it break through here on breath that is like you know, 1.6 to one negative, or does it break through there on breath that's six to one negative? Super important, two different types of markets. And then we, and then, you know, should we go to the single prints and we go like this and we get maybe to here, maybe to this value area, I don't know, whatever. And we just kind of stall. And then out of the blue, we rally and we start to develop value here. Okay, enormous amounts of market generated information have just been dropped in your lap. Should you sell Apple? Absolutely not. Should you sell any longs? Absolutely not. What is the market telling us? No change. There's been absolutely no change. Value is developing almost the same. I know that we should have accelerated through here because we got, we should have some nervous longs, but they didn't, but the sellers didn't appear. 
remember that just because the market paints a picture or, or presents a scenario, that doesn't mean that it has to follow through on that scenario and do it, right? I mean, you know, think about it. That's the essence of how every losing trade starts. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Everybody has losing trades, but think about it. Every losing trade starts the same way. You thought X was gonna happen and Y happened. What I'm saying is that you can, as X is starting to happen, you should be looking for clues using the profile to tell you if it's actually gonna be something and you should change your position or initiate a new position in the other direction, or it's just gonna be nothing. And that's super valuable, I think. That, that right. has helped me a lot in the profile. That, this has helped me tons. You know, I know what the I know what should happen at these levels. I know that this is this is a house of cards. I know that this is a house of cards, but that doesn't matter. This market has shown over and over and over that it'll sit on this house of cards for seven sessions. It does not care. It does not care. It doesn't matter. So you get it. There's a lot of information to be gleaned there. Okay, you've got another question for you right there, what you're talking about, Peter. How do you determine what level is important and you want to pay attention to during the trading session versus just other uh, levels? Well, those are the, so for instance, Terry, like those are the key levels that I give every morning in my morning report. And like Terry was Correct. saying, um, you know, in the, before when he introduced me in the session, uh, I do have a five day free trial. So if you're interested, you can check it out and you can read this report every day and you can see if the key levels make any sense to you. And so the only thing I'll say about that is I, I put a lot of effort every morning into those key levels because I'm a big believer that I do not want to just list everything. People who read my report every morning know that the key levels are very salient and they're very specific. And for instance, I could easily every morning just say, this is overnight high, this is POC, this is value area high, this is value area low, this is settlement, this is RTH low, this is top of single print, this is da 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 and have 10 different key levels. That doesn't mean anything. Anybody can do that. Anybody can just list everything from top to bottom over the last two days and say, well, you know, some or, some or none of these should be in play. That's meaningless. What I do is different, is I look at every day separately as if it was, uh, you know, obviously every day is its own day, but I look at every potential key level separately and I try my best to only present those that I know will have some value. So for instance, like, let's say that you had, uh, like a good way to, a good way to put it would be like, let's say that these single prints here were not on a gap and go like this. Let's say that these single prints were like somewhere inside of here inside of a range that was, you know, a healthy range, a good distribution like this. Do you under, and then we gap up like way above it and we're up here. So this kind, these types of single prints, you know, in, in the context of the prior day, they have less meaning really. You know, these are important because they're on top of a gap. You had a gap and then you kept going. So you kind of added structure on top of structure. So as I'm coming, as I'm trading here, this is important. But for instance, this right here may not be as important, you know, after a couple sessions because it's far away. You know, just things like that. Um, you know, like tomorrow, what would I list? This would be a key level because it is the all time high overnight. And oh, here's a perfect example. I'll show you exactly. This is gonna be a key level tomorrow morning. This is also gonna be a key level tomorrow morning but only because it's a poor high. If this high wasn't poor, if it was excess like this, I would not list that. And that's the, exam so that's the perfect example of how I only give you what's important. Because if this is a regular high and it has excess and the all time high is here, there's no distinction to me between this and this. There's none. When the difference between these two levels is like five handles or whatever, there's no distinction there. The market, the market will not care about yesterday's high. It'll look at this as an area and it'll say, you know, if it's gonna target that, it's just gonna go to the all time high. So there's like a nuance there that you kind of have to, 
develop over time as to what's important. And I, I can't stress that enough. You know, a lot of people write about this stuff and they give you, you know, 20 key levels over the course of the day, say, you know, all this isn't, you know, just here's here's all these different highs and lows. Or, you know, I've seen people that will have profile charts or even technical charts that just absolutely look like spaghetti. And they have 18 different indicators and they've got their profile broken out into whatever and then they've got volume profile on the <coughs> on the side <coughs> and they're marking off all these high and low volume nodes all over in this composite profile everywhere and you know just kind of ascribing importance to too many things and there's just no way that that has any value i don't think because unless you're a very 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 short term trader who's just constantly looking for very tiny moves from this level to that level and this, that level, this level and whatever. It's just A, overkill and B, the way the mind works when it's presented with information is that if it's presented with too much information in a steady stream, the mind will discount most of that information. The mind will A, not know which information to put emphasis on, and all new information that comes in, because it's coming in at a, at a constant rapid rate, any new information that comes in will not be looked upon with any sort of, you know, like value or importance or weight, right? Think about it. Like, you know, that's why I always say, like, I uh, part of what I do is, uh, I run an alert service, um, which is called Weekly Options Advisory. You can check that out on our site under the Options tab of our site. And what I do in that advisory is I send people options trades to their phone all day long. And we do like, you know, five or six trades a week. Uh, it's pretty active. But then also throughout the course of the day, I send messages periodically when I see something important. Like, perfect example was I sent a message this afternoon when I saw that the poor high was developing. And I took a snapshot, I went, Ch -ch -ch, took a picture, and I sent it out to my subscribers and it came to their phones instantaneously and it said, look, developing poor high. Well, guess what? That's when the market was up here and it fell down to here. So during the course of the day, I do things like that. What I'm trying to get to in a circuitous fashion is that I'm very, very limited and careful with how many of these messages I put out. Because if I put out too many of them, you'll ignore it, right? If I, if I started putting out messages saying, oh, look, the market's approaching value area high. You know, oh, look, the market is coming to the point of control. You know, oh, look, this, this, oh, look, that. It won't have much, it won't be actionable to you when I say, hey, heads up, developing poor high, right? It's, you're not really gonna care. So I really try my best. So it's this, it's the same exact thing with, to answer the question, what is a key level and what is not a key level, right? That's how this whole discussion started, right? The, the person right. asked, what, what makes you decide what's a key level, what's not a key level? Yeah, less how do is you, more, yeah. how do right? you less, less is them? more, Terry, less is more. Right. I, I think less is more and 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 put more weight on those that you're sure are going to have some inflection, some turning point, something. The, the way to do the key levels is pretty simple, is think in terms of what the masses will do. What will the other parties do when faced with that level? So if there's a poor high, that's important because the initial inclination is always to back away from the poor high. I have found literally that the poor high, poor low, I will say this right now on the record, is the strongest market profile signal that exists. It li I literally believe that. I've come to believe that more and more and more over time. Over time, certain things work and certain things don't. And to me, the poor high, poor low has gotten better as a signal over time. It just keeps showing improving. Even on a developing poor high during the day, market backs off. If you close on a, you have a developing poor high and you close near it, futures back off overnight, whatever. So, those, so that's important, right? So I'm always gonna mention that. 
So because why? Because that's a level where I see there's a turn. If I had a poor high from yesterday and the market already backed off from it, you can be sure I'm going to mention it as a poor high again. Why? Because the second inclination of the poor high is what? Is to repair. Longs that are trapped at bad location create the poor high because they don't get capitulation to the upside. They don't get paid. They're long at bad location. They're nervous. They sell. What will happen when prices go back to the poor high? They should go higher because now those people have been made whole. New traders can come in. A new auction begins, so to speak. And we know that the nature of the profile is to repair, right? The market doesn't like gaps. The market doesn't like profiles that are incomplete. So we go there. So that's going to be a that's going to be a key level the next day. So knowing that that's a key level, I look where I look past it, and I say to myself, okay, if that's a key level, like for instance, we can say this tomorrow. What if we trade here tomorrow? And this is still poor. Okay, that's a key level for Thursday or whatever. And then obviously this has to be a key level. Why? Because it's the next inflection point where price is turned before, you know, it, it, it's the last swing high. So it's obvious, you know. And then of course there's all this stuff below us that's important. This is obviously a single print on top of a gap. So it bears mention until. You know, let's say the market dribbles higher and we get to 4550. Well, then it doesn't make sense to mention it, right? I mean, the market's only going to do how much it's going to do each day. But, you know, I don't know. I hope that 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 gives you at least a little window into how I think about the poor levels and, you know, how I choose them and, you know, why I choose them every day. That was really great, Peter. All right. I'm going to ask you one more question here, then use it as a segue into talking about what you see maybe for the balance of the year. Here's the question. Given the fact that we are coming into September, historically the worst month of the year for long plays, and the fact that price action is so sluggish, are you cautious about entering into any swing or long trades, long-term trades? Absolutely, 100%. I. I am I I'm not much of a uh you know stock market almanac type of person. I don't really ever want to hang my hat on oh well it's September, you know, so we should pull back. I don't I don't think that's a good way to think. But it does make sense for instance to think this way and we'll just I'll put up a different chart here. I'll clear all this. It does make sense to look at things like this. Um look at SPX Let's shift to let's shift to monthly. This this is what I think about. I don't care that it's September. Um, I don't care about that. I care about this that this is unsustainable. That we know what one time framing means, and look at how long we've been one time framing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've been one time framing for ten month 10 sessions on a monthly chart 10 months right we know what is one time framing it's when we you know here's the market is one time framing is when the low of every session is higher than the prior low it's allowed for instance in the profile if you want to get nitty gritty about it to one to one time frame in the es you can take out the prior day's low by two ticks or less and still be one time framing on a cash market chart, there's no real special rule for that. You know, you could say, oh, well, it, you know, this one is equal. So, you know, whatever, however you want to say it. But, you know, for instance, this I would say is still one time framing because the low here is uh, 37.25.62. This low is 37.23.34. So these two points don't really make a low here. So really 10 months straight of one time framing. So when people say does it make you nervous or would you would you back off the answer has to be yes because the market or i should say let's put it another way speculation is nothing more than a game of odds and the odds are when you look at a chart like this that at some point the prior day's low should get taken the prior month's low should get taken out and if the prior month's low gets taken out that's a big move. 
I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, as big a move as we got here. You know, it doesn't have to be this, but it could be something. It could certainly be this, right? It could be this, right? It could be this one. And we, I'm just saying we haven't had that at all in, you know, in a very long time. So 10 months, I think, is a long time to be one time framing that way. And also pay attention also to the uh, uh, steepness, for lack of a better word, you know, the, the angle of the decline, of the, not of the decline, of the rise. You have this to here. And it really kind of just gets steeper at the end. It's it's almost parabolic. So that generally is unsustainable because what happens in markets is very simply that the prevailing, uh, you know, the the prevailing side, for lack of a better word, just runs out of bullets. And that's important to note. Also, is retail traders can be nimble and pick the top and maybe short the top but the bigger money won't do that because that's not really their game and they can't turn their battleship around that quickly they've got a lot to get rid of so in order for them to pare down they start really hitting it a little bit later or maybe after the first counter trend bounce you'll get a move that'll be down and then there'll be a violent counter trend rally and it'll be like the first time it'll be like two three days of up but it won't make it to the high and that very often is a strong signal. A lot of these moves, if you look at them, that's how they happen where you had, you know, you had this move up and then a big one big down day, but then the next couple of days were up and then kind of like that. So, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, basically. In a nutshell, my answer is yes to that. And people should definitely pay attention to these monthly charts as they get uh, more and more stretched. So you're a good answer, Peter. Yep. Okay. Peter, we have quite a few questions here that are left. What I'm going to do is that um, I'm going to, uh, pr I'll print them out, and then you and I can talk about these later and uh, prepare some answers to them and send them out. There's no way we're going to be able to cover them all now. So Yeah, I mean, we're kind of towards the end of our time here. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anyway, I want to thank you very much for setting aside your time today. and. Uh, we have a survey at the end, and if you have any questions in addition to the ones that you have put into the question box, please uh, type them in, and we will respond to the questions. So you know that. Also, be sure to check out Peter's website on the pre-market perspectives, his newsletter every day, and the with, uh, the video that he produces every uh, publishes every Sunday. Also, if you have yeah. any questions about Window Trader, you can go to our site and contact us. In addition to that, uh, if you have any questions that you want me to answer, uh, feel free to contact me at TCL at Window Trader. So, yeah. thanks Absolutely. for your Here's time you today. Great, Peter. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Take care. Everybody. It's been always fun speaking with you. I enjoyed it. Okay. Talk to you later. Have a great day, right. everybody. Bye-bye.